if Carolyn Yashari is in the room, I want to invite you to come on up for a moment, if you don't mind. Carolyn Yashari. is your uh, invitation to join me. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, everyone. Shabbat shalom. I hope you all got something to eat. It's good to be together. There's a little bit of room up here if people need space to, if we don't, we don't, if we don't have enough chairs for everyone, feel free to come sit down here, up close. <laughs> right. Thank you. That's right, Matan. Okay, welcome everyone. I'm going to draw your attention up here. Um, first, I, I'm Rabbi Sharon Browse. It is a great joy um, to welcome all of you. I know we have lots of visitors and guests. In addition to our Ikar community, who are the diehards because they've been here since 9.30 this morning. Uh, so, um, so I'm really grateful to all of you for being here. Um, Ikar is honored to host you here. Um, I'm grateful to, uh, to Shalhevet, the high school where we rent space, where we're holding this event today. And so many of our services as Ikar works to build our own, uh, our own space, but it really feels like a great joy to have you here at this basketball court and this gym. Um, I want to thank, first of all, a couple of our sponsor, co-sponsors today. Um, so the folks here from Hodge, we welcome you. Thank you. We have Repair the World LA. Who's here? Where are you? Repair the World LA. Welcome. Um, anyone connected to the New Israel Fund, which I imagine is most of the people in the room or many of you, um, thank you to NIF. To the Black Jewish Justice Alliance, thank you for co-sponsoring into Camp Gilboa. Yeah, we've got lots of co-sponsors because it turns out lots and lots of people want and need to have this conversation today. So, um, so I am thrilled uh, to be able to introduce to you today um, two friends and two people who I admire Two people who I admire so deeply, um, people of moral courage and of clarity and of vision. And, um, and this conversation is a conversation that we began together some years ago already. Um, they've been to ICAR before, so many of you have met Alon Lee and Sally here at ICAR. Many of you have joined them in their work in Israel um, over the course of the last several years, and especially in the course of the last five months, um, they have become a real voice of hope for so many of us who are living and dwelling every day in a landscape of despair. And so I am absolutely thrilled that we could have you here today. I know it's not easy to leave home and to come here on this tour, but I think you can tell by the reception that you had in November when you were on the East Coast and now on this trip that the diaspora communities desperately need to hear from you. So Sally Abed, 
to my right is an elected national leader at Standing Together, the Jewish Arab grassroots movement that mobilizes people around issues of peace, equality, and social justice. In recent years, she has become a prominent progressive Palestinian voice in Israel. Sally is a recurring guest on the Promise podcast and the co-host of the new podcast, Groundwork, a mini-series about Palestinians and Jews, refusing to accept the status quo and instead working together for change. Sally's voice... Sally's voice is one that I trust, is one that I turn to myself, and is one that I am so pleased that all of you will get to hear from today. A lonely green sitting to Sally's right is the national co-director and uh, a founder of Standing Together. He got his start organizing Israel's first trade union of waiters in a chain of coffee shops at, and went on to found Israel's first national waiters union. Alon Lee emerged as a prominent leader of Israel's social protest movement in the summer of 2011 and subsequently served as a political advisor in the Knesset, Israel's parliament. It is uh, with great joy that we get to have in person now the people whose faces and voices are the ones that are echoing across our screens. Um, when, when we don't know where else to turn. And so I'm thrilled that standing together, Omdim Biachad, Nakif Ma'an, are here to be with us to share your great light. Alon Lee and Sally Abed, thank you so much uh, for joining us once again. I... I started to write um, during the week an introduction to this panel, and I realized actually that that short intro should instead uh, be a full sermon. So that's the sermon I gave earlier to you today. I'll share it with you. I, I, I'll share it with you afterwards. Um, but I want to just create the space um, for all for us to hear from you. Um, I will say, since we have so many folks who are new to um, this environment today. I want to establish just a, some, some norms for us as we engage in this conversation today. Part of what it means to write a new story is that we're gonna hear things that we might not agree with. And in this climate where everything is black and white and right and wrong, where everything is so binary, we have to introduce a different kind of listening when we're able to hear and to see and to encounter ideas and people who leave us feeling not oppressed by their views, but more curious. And so I'm inviting us into a headspace and a heart space of curiosity today, in which Sally and Alon Lee are going to introduce uh, to our community and reintroduce for some of us, many of the ideas that are at the foundation of their vision of what a shared and just future could look like. I am certain that not everybody in this room will agree with exactly the way that they see this future, and that's okay. We're not here to agree with each other. We're here to respectfully engage, to open our hearts and minds, and to imagine a different kind of future than the future of eternal war, which I think, I hope everyone in this room can agree is not a future. So I wanna start by inviting you both um, to just introduce yourselves to us by way of answering my first question, which is, how is your heart and how are your families? Okay. What a question. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Hi. Um, how's our heart? Um, um, it's broken. It's shattered. Um, it's um, almost surreal to come here and, and get so much love and, and so much support. Um, you know, the work that we do back home uh, is extremely difficult. It's extremely thankless and ungrateful. <laughs> um, so coming here and receiving that much love, uh, you know, is, is just amazing. Thank you. Um, I think we are at a place where 
I feel an immense responsibility. Uh, it, it's, it's weighing very heavily on us, um, especially as Palestinians, um, you know, in Israel. Um, you know, having to go through both the experiences of oppression, of conditioned existence, conditioned citizenship, conditioned, you know, like grief, right? We can't even grief our people. Um, you know, we're witnessing, all of us are, are, you know, hurting and we're witnessing one of the most terrible human catastrophes in our century. Um, and um, I can't grief it safely back home. Um, but that being said, I'm also exposed and, and sharing the grief and the pain of the Israeli society while also getting the backlash as the enemy, right? It's a very complex experience. Um, that I can talk a lot about, but maybe we can get into that later. Um, I do think that we are at a junction, um, and I feel the responsibility heavily weighing on us to take this into um, a place of radical empathy, of um, a lot of humanity, a lot of forgiveness, um, understanding the extremely ugly truth and uh, extremely ugly realities that we are facing, and that also understanding that the change doesn't always come from shouting that ugly truth to people, which is very difficult to do. Um, my parents are scared. My parents are on the Lebanese borders right now, surrounded by like 12 army bases uh, in a Palestinian village um, in the north of Israel. Um, and they are feeling the madness around them. Um, I always share a shocking story, and I'm sorry, I'm going to shock you. <laughs> On October 8th, when we started going out and doing our solidarity watches, you know, Jewish Arab solidarity watches, Jewish Palestinian in, in big cities and around the country, and really being vocal about things, and then obviously being vocal about um, the Hamas attack on October 7th, and then the Israeli attack in, in Gaza. And uh, my mom called me, and she was like, Sally, shut the F up. The master is hurting. And um, I think that really, I always tell this story just to summarize, not to, for you to feel bad, <laughs> or to, to say, oh, that's terrible. We know it's terrible, <laughs> you know? We know, you know, the class B citizenship of Palestinians in Israel. Um, I'm saying this story for you to understand the importance of our existence because at the same time, while we are feeling that fear that, oh my God, we're on trial right now. Um, you know, we have to like abide and we have to be good while witnessing, you know, what's happening to our people and being persecuted ourselves. We also actually feel and share the pain of the Israeli society. We actually have the ability and the experience to understand it deeply. And I think that duality is just so absolutely critical. So absolutely critical. Um, and I think standing together in many ways is trying to harvest that kind of community, that kind of culture of, of radical empathy, of solidarity, um, of acceptance through activism, through people's politics and people's movement. And we'll talk a little bit about it later, but uh, that's what we're trying to do. And that's what's going to, in many ways, save us. And I really believe that. 
Um, so my heart is also heavy. Um, and I think I'm afraid. Um, coming here, getting a bit of distance already for three or four days um, in the US from what is going in Israel, in Palestine, I feel as if it's obvious that we're feeling like we're falling in, into this dark hole and we're like free falling and free falling. And whenever you think you hit the rock bottom, you realize it's ain't it, you keep falling and it doesn't come. And it's, it's not only the death and the grief and the sorrow, and it's not only the destruction, it's not only the people that were evacuated in Israel or in, in, in Gaza, it's not only, um, you know, the, the reality that we, we feel, we witness, the things we can see in the news, it's also our society. Um, it's also the choices that the people are making or are not able to make in our society about how empathic we allow ourselves to be in this moment, about how do we allow ourselves to see that we are hurting and we are afraid, but there are other people who are hurting and are afraid as well. And you know, we're also scared sometimes because of the reaction, reactions that we get. It's easy now in Israel to call us traitors. It's easy to look at us and you know, think our ideas of equality or peace or you know, having a reality where everyone are free, um, are radical. And, and I guess I know the answer, right? I know the answer to say that this is the most patriotic thing, thing a person can do to fight, to end the occupation, to end the war, to achieve Israeli-Palestinian peace. I know how to tell it to myself. I know how to say it in public. But deep inside, I do feel um, afraid. Afraid of the possibility of people making um, the choice, the wrong choice in this historic junction we hit. It's either we're going to eternal war where we will face mutual destruction and we have the ability to do that to each other on this land. We do have, both of us can hurt each other and I don't want to draw parallels and say, you know, it's the same, but we can both do that or we take the direction of a complete different reality, of peace, of a resolution, of solutions to our problems. And this feeling of you know, working hard to make people do this choice to come with us, but still knowing that there are dangerous forces working to make, you know, people choose the other choice, that's very scary. I, I know before October 7th, you had, sta standing together, gotten to the point where there were tens of thousands of people who would join you on street corners for protests. Um, during during moments of r real heat in previous years, you were this incredible presence there that said, we can choose another way. One of the things that, that we've talked about is how, um, is how my message before October 7th and now is the same message, but I'm speaking it in a different tone of voice, be more tenderly, because we're so broken and we kind of can't hear we, we can't hear things the way that we could have before because, you know, I think the, the idea that we have to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, it, you know, I think pre-October 7th was more of an afflict the comfortable moment for, at least in my work, and now it's a comfort the afflicted moment. And I wonder, given what the work was before, if you can talk a little bit about the organization and the work and how it's shifted since October 7th. How do you take that message this vision that you have and bring it to, um, to people who are all shattered right now and all traumatized. How, are, how have you found that the work has changed? Um, for people who don't know a little bit about standing together, you know, and about our work, our work stems from two understandings, two fundamentals. One, you need to build a new political story that tells, um, you know, that creates a new protagonist, right? A new majority, a new us. Who's us? And really, um, uh, that stems not from uh, only talking about solidarity of one of the strong group, you know, whether it's 
Jewish towards the Palestinians, whether it's, I don't know, the, the Ashkenazi towards the non-white Jewish, uh, whether it's, you know, the different, the center and the affluent towards the peripheries and the margins and all these different things. But actually from understanding that every single a struggle that we have towards peace, towards equality, towards social and climate justice are actually, you know, a shared interest of the majority of the people. Um, and, and we have led campaigns around climate justice, around livable wage, and really, uh, you know, um, creating new lines of alliances between ultra-Orthodox and Palestinians, you know, between uh, LGBTQ and, and conservatives, between, you know, different groups, peripheries and center, secular and religious, all of these different, and obviously the biggest dichotomy, which is Jewish and Palestinian and creating a new kind of majority through these social justice campaigns, livable wage, affordable housing. Um, and we do that through, you know, building a new public narrative, a new story, a new current of thought. Uh, the other thing is organizing, community organizing. Uh, it's not enough to react to our reality, we need to be very proactive and actually build sustainable power, a social movement, an ecosystem that can actually build the, the institutions, the necessary institutions to also absorb but also enact the deep change that we want to see. And the reason why I'm saying this context is because, you know, prior to October 7th, we were about to launch our affordable housing campaign, you know. <laughs> Um, which is still a very, very, very important thing that I'm going to deal with as well in Haifa, you know, during the city councilship. Um, and it, it's very important people's politics that we need to remain relevant to people's lives. People, you know, you cannot convince them to come with you. You cannot mobilize them if what you're saying is not relevant to their lives. It, you can't. We need, you know, we know that our enemy, our enemy has more money than us. They definitely have so much more money than us. They have a lot more political power right now. But what we have is people. We need to build a people's movement. And after October 7th, you know, I think what changed in many ways, um, we looked at ourselves, we looked at our society, which is currently in a very, very deep state of paralysis almost. You know, the Palestinian society is completely paralyzed from persecution and fear. You know, we are under trial, you know, we're always under trial. We're always under trial for loyalty, to be the good Arabs, right? But now, more than ever, um, the Jewish society is presented with this one alternative. There's nothing else on the menu, eternal war. And you have, really, in many ways, you know, uh, throughout the spectrum of politics, even if you go to the very moderate liberal center right now in Israel, which is the, the, you know, the, the very end of the spectrum because there's no real left left in Israel. You see a, a similar you know, version of the same reality, the same menu. Um, no one is actually giving the alternative of partnership, of solidarity, of peace, of equality and freedom for all. No one is giving that option. And we realized that that's us. Standing together will have to be the next people's peace movement. And, and I think in a way, you know, this deep, deep crisis also provides very deep clarity of that mission, but also that the question of peace has also been, has for, for, you know, for the first time in decades, is actually on the table. 
it actually can be presented and be part of the menu because literally people are now, you know, have endured such loss, such trauma, with no one telling them how it's going to end, you know, and we have the opportunity to give them a people's politics that talks about peace. And that's an opportunity that's presented to us with all the pain, with all the loss. It's actually an opportunity to create that relevancy for people right now. That's the junction right now. It's so, it's incredible what you're saying. And I, I just want to, this has been, there's been a smattering of conversation about this in the last, um, in the last few weeks, people noticing that never in their lives have they experienced an anti-war movement that is so strong and so vocal and is not also a pro-peace movement. And yet this anti-war moment is not about peace in the street. And that's why the vision that I think you're putting forward is so powerful and so important. And I noticed the same thing that, I mean, for, for 20 years, when we would talk, every time I would give a sermon about peace here, I would hear from a dozen Israeli colleagues and friends who would say, peace, you're so out of step with Israelis. Like, nobody's talking about peace. There will be no peace in our lifetime. There will be no peace for at least a century. And, and I, I kept responding, saying, if we don't talk about it, then of course it will never happen. Like, we're not going to create a reality that we're too afraid to dream of. But there were very, there, there weren't a lot of people, I mean, it felt almost embarrassing to talk about peace for the last 20 years. Then all of a sudden, after October 7th, more and more people are talking about peace. And I don't, I don't think it's so penetrated the Israeli discourse outside of standing together. But here in the diaspora, now we're hearing it, not on the street, but in other places where those words haven't been spoken, I'm hearing more and more talk about, um, about some kind of long-term, sustainable, negotiated peace in which Israelis and Palestinians can live a thriving and just future. And I feel, thank God, that you're there on the ground um, sounding that call because now we're starting to see the, the movement in the discourse here that you can't be anti-war and not pro-peace. There has to be something that we're striving for on the other side of it. So this message, how, how is it being received by not, I don't mean the people who are already in the movement, but by the people that you're trying to have this reverberative impact and change the culture and change the way people are, are feeling um, and the, the language that they're using. How are, you, how, are, how are people receiving this message? Um, first of all, you're absolutely right. Um, the opposite of war, the opposite of occupation is not, you know, abstract ideas or some, you know, pure justice. It is peace. It is something realistic that we need to demand and we need to present. And without it, we're like condemning reality, but there's a very big change and difference between condemning reality and changing reality. And we're here to really change reality. Um, and I think that people in Israel, um, and it's not something that I guess it's, is easy to witness or see from outside, but people in Israel are desperate and are hungry for solutions, for someone that will come and tell them what is going to happen. No one knows. Think of it. We're like five months into this nightmare, decades into this reality that never changes to the good, but just like continue to escalate and, and deteriorate. And people understand that we hit the junction. People understand that something exploded in a way that it will never be restored. The 7th of October for all of us, you know, even in the first hours, sitting in our homes, seeing the horrors of Hamas, understanding that something is developing, not believing that this thing that we are seeing the videos in the social media or reading the things in the news hearing the sign, we didn't believe it's a real thing. It was hard to comprehend, to like believe it's really happening. And we understood in these hours that this is a life-changing moment. Nothing is going to be the same afterwards. Then five months after, what we're seeing in Gaza, the destruction, the killing, the amount of children that has been bombed and, 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 and killed, we understand that this is not a moment that will be able to you know, reverse and to come back to what was in October 6th. And people are looking for, to an understanding, okay, so when this phase will end, what is going to happen? Are we going to assume control over Gaza? Is it going to be occupation like the right wing is calling? You know, the right wing is an 
on a very, very powerful campaign right now. They have billboards all across the country. They have speakers on, on TV. And, and, and they are saying, occupy, expel, resettle. That's their plan. And it's vocal. It's out there. Those three words, you can read them everywhere right now. And they, they present a solution which is not a solution. It's just a recipe for more bloodshed, right? But they talk about it. And some people are being convinced because they don't, as Sally said, they don't hear about another solution. But people are searching to hear what can be something um, uh, sustainable, what can be something that promises them um, uh, a better life, a safe life, an opportunity to stay on the land. A lot of young families, Jewish families, are thinking, you know, immigration is the only possible way. Um, to survive as a family. And I think that here comes our role. Um, a, talking not only, and we do, but talking not only about solidarity with the Palestinians, not only acknowledging the fact that millions of Palestinians are living under the military control of Israel without being Israeli citizens. This is occupation and we resist it. But talking also about our self-interest, about the fact that this reality is not good for us as Jewish people. This reality does not create good um, uh, environment to raise our children. It, it creates violence that we are also, you know, in our turn, victims of. And addressing um, this solution that we're trying to do, not as an idea of, you know, moralities of uh, only pure solidarity, but talking about the life that you want for yourself as something that we need to work for and enabling the possibility to take part in creating this change for yourself. This is our task. This is our mission. Um, and it will be more powerful and more um, achievable um, than, you know, just ignoring reality or thinking that politics of, you know, ending the occupation or wanting peace is only for the ones that saw the light and they're all, you know, so moral that they stand in solidarity with Palestinians. It needs to be a self-interest fight. Otherwise, we will not win. I only spoke about the, the Jewish Israelis, and, and, and I think uh, it's important to also talk about the Palestinians. Obviously, you know, for the Palestinians, it's a completely different mission. It's not about convincing them. I think the Palestinians are already convinced. Um, it's more about creating um, the safe spaces for them, and, and, and that's important for me. You know, we, we talk about solidarity as something that is important, but not enough. And we need to also talk about empowering, you know, Palestinians in Israel. And I think that's something, you know, people think it's like almost, it's dangerous. It's like, why are, like, it's so radical. It's not. Israel and Israeli society will never be able to become a just, equal place if it doesn't, not only accept and tolerate but like integrate and recognize and heal the Palestinian parts of it. And, and that starts with Palestinian youth, with Palestinian people and that's, you know, it's something that we have been working on very, very heavily on student campuses. We are running, you know, we're, we're modeling Palestinian leadership that is not compromising our, our narrative, our history, our pain, but also demanding a place to lead, not accept solidarity, to lead within Israeli society. And I think that's extremely critical. Before October 7th, I was involved in a series of conversations um, about how that piece of the vision of the future might be realized. And what, what was so exciting about the conversations was that we entered, we left the realm of the real and the limitations of the real, and we entered the dreamscape. And 
um, and, and we started to think about what would we actually dream could be possible and how would we get there? And so people started saying things like, what if there were museums that told the Jewish narrative and the Palestinian narrative of 1948? Wouldn't that be incredible so that visitors who come to Jerusalem could walk through halls and hear stories, for like recordings of elders talking about what they experienced and what they learned from their parents and wars that were fought and peace that was made. We started looking at reparations models here in the United States and the whole idea of a TRC. And all of a sudden, when we allowed ourselves to believe that there could be a future other than a future of eternal war, we realize that we, we have mechanisms for healing, for tshuva, for, for transforming society, transforming relationships, but we have to be able to get to the dream, to the space of the, of the dream, which first means overcoming the hurdles, the impossible hurdles that have been set before us. And I think that what happened, you know, well, before October 7th, but what happened when, when Bibi ushered in this government, the most right-wing, ultra-nationalist, messianic, you know, arsonist government in Israel's history and for 10 months there were these protests on the street there was this birth of like wait we can do something different but it's going to require us not not sitting in the inertia of what is but forcing the hand of history and building what could be the reaction to those extremists built this democracy movement and then and then the extremists of the of Hamas then redefined history once again and, and, it be, and, and then Smotrich and Ben Gvir, the extremists of the, you know, of, the, of the Israeli government, are redefining by talking about the morning after and being the only ones in the government in the public space that we're hearing talk about the morning after. So it feels like once the voices of the extremists are, if we could imagine those voices being marginalized and instead enter the dreamscape of the voices where I actually think the majority of people live, millions of people who just want a future for themselves and their children. So, so then what could we dream to be possible? And how exciting to think about museums and shared language courses and shared universities and, you know, and, and, and even, even national anthems. And like there's so many things that become possible in that space. And the hurdle is the biggest hurdle that we will ever face in our lifetimes, which is the hurdle of not just political extremism, but messianic political extremism, which is rooted in religious ideology that is us versus them, that is totally binary. And then is being, you know, and that message is reverberating powerfully throughout the world. So I, I, I so resonate to this call to kind of create that, to create that space and even to have the courage to even put out some of these ideas which seem insane right now, but ultimately are the only way that there will be a future. I've heard both of you say many times over the years, there are millions of people who live in this place and aren't going anywhere, so we have to figure it out, right? And so, um, so I, I wanna ask you, it seems like that acknowledgement of the complex reality of the dynamic, the population that lives on the ground. The fact that Jews and Palestinians, forgive me, of all the world's people, are the people who in this world are like at the heel of society, right? That, that Jews and Palestinians are the people who nobody else is like, come to me, I'll take you, you know, build a thriving future here. And so we find ourselves holding on to this tiny piece of you know, of land or this little piece of wood in the ocean that keeps lifting us back up to surface and giving us a chance to breathe. Um, once, what, from out of the depths of that complex reality that you have described, it seems like that's where the vision is being born. And so I, I would love for you to address a little bit some of, not Ben Gvir and not Hamas, but what about the binary thinking that's happening in the rest of society? Um, that's being echoed, especially throughout the diaspora right now, where people feel like they have to join a camp and you're either on this side, you either disavow Israel or you don't care about justice, or you disavow the Palestinian National uh, Lib Movement for Liberation, or you don't, or you're an anti-Semite. How do you address that kind of binary thinking, not from the, not from the people who obviously their voices are going to need to be totally marginalized in order for there to be peace, but from the people who think they're helping and actually end up only um, creating more of a false uh, distinction in a world of a truly complex reality. I can say something. <laughs> I, I can say something short about it. I think here's, here's a, 
No, not in, no, 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 no. No, here's the truth. Um, I'm a proud Jewish person, and I want to talk about my angle again, sorry, about the angle of the Jews in Israel. The truth is that if the Palestinians will lose, I will lose. If I will try to imagine what will happen on this land, if we will get this, you know, Netanyahu promises the complete victory. This is what he says. If we'll get this complete victory, I, my family, my society will lose. Only violence will be created out of this, and we will pay the price, a different kind of price from the Palestinians. But also if the Jews will lose, Palestinians will lose. So when you come to join a camp, don't think of saying, I'm Israel, hi, I'm staying in, standing with all the Jews, or from the river to the sea, I don't care what happened with the Jews. Try and think about this basic truth that there is no choice but somehow find a solution to share this land, because no one is going anywhere. Seven million Jews will remain on this land. Seven million Palestinians will remain on the same land. By the way, we both call this land our homeland. This is the only home we have. And if we will not be able to find a solution where somehow, somehow, we all have equality and freedom and safety, a safe life, then it will just continue. And then the camp that you're siding with will lose as well. So be in the camp of supporting the people. If you're pro-Israeli people, you must be also pro-Palestinian people. If you're pro-Palestinian, you must be also pro-Israeli. Disconnected also from the government. Disconnected, we are, are, we are not our government. And it is a way to see things and understand that this truth will be, we cannot change it. I feel like I, I, always, I want to give the contra always. <laughs> we are a duo. <laughs> um, that's true. Um, you know, obviously, and, and we always say, you know, um, uh, I get criticized a lot as a Palestinian for saying, you know, I do talk to predominantly, you know, to Jewish audience back home, you know, they're the majority, they're the ones that need convincing, right? And even here I come and I talk to also a lot of, you know, the Jewish diaspora. And they always, you know, um, they, they criticize that we, we, uh, um, we always instru instrumentalize Palestinian, uh, you know, liberation and freedom for Jewish safety, so to convince <laughs> you know, the people, that it's needed uh, and that it's not something that is, you know, essentially, ideologically, you know, he, you know, something that is so deeply urgent. Um, and I, I think that's something that's important to say. You know, I am, I'm, we're getting attacked from both sides, by the way, which is sometimes, if you think about it, it's validating, you know. Um, but uh, um, it, it's important to say, you know, within the Palestinian, uh, you know, pro-Palestinian movements here, um, first of all, they're trying to say something to all of us. We should listen to them. Um, I think the Palestinian uh, diaspora and just the collective has been delegitimized and oppressed and uh, neglected and um, denied for decades. And it's finally becoming something that is receiving so much solidarity. Um, and I think it's time um, for us to also assume the responsibility of this much support and this much acknowledgement um, and practice, especially here, Palestinians here, and the, by here, I mean diaspora, you know, refugees outside who have some kind of space, you know, from the oppressive system while still holding the trauma and, and the narrative and, and the truth. We, we have, you have, I am not part of that, <laughs> um, the responsibility to also practice and find some kind of radical empathy um, and understand uh, not only radical empathy, it's, it's also really understanding how can we 
let go of these theorized fantasies of liberation into like real solutions and change that can stop the killing, stop the incarceration, stop the military control, stop the oppression, stop the violence against our people on the land. Um, and I think we need to move there. It's going to be very, very critical to move there. And I say that all the time. And I, I always extend my invitation for, for the Palestinian diaspora to connect to Palestinians in Israel. We have been disconnected for too long, deliberately. <laughs> it's engineered. <laughs> we have been disconnected for too long. And I think it's a critical bridge that we need to build yeah, going forward. So I, I really um, appreciate, you've now called for radical empathy twice, and I so, I hear you, and I, I really appreciate your, um, your very empathic description or explanation of where many people in the pro-Palestine national movement are um, in the diaspora. Um, this is a hard question, so, um, so I want to ask you this. And I saw Aziza Hassan here, our beloved friend, um, who, um, Palestinian American who built new ground and has actually spent decades trying to, not just trying, bringing Jews and Muslims um, together to have really hard conversations and build relationships. And I'm so, th and I thank God for you, Aziza, and for your partnership and for your leadership. And um, and the work that Aziza has been doing along with, I know there are lots of people from Newground actually here today, and this work is rooted in the premise that we, we can't build a, a just and shared future if we don't see each other as human beings, um, right? If we, don't, if we don't invest in relationships with each other. And there is in the Palestinian nationalist movement a, an anti-normalization um, principle. And I know that because of that, anti-normalization meaning, as I understand it, like you shouldn't talk to Israel, Palestinians shouldn't talk to Israelis because it's normalizing an unjust reality, which is the occupation. And so you fight to create a more just reality first, and then we'll be friends, like we'll have hummus later, we're not having it now. And in fact, some of the people who um, were critical of your um, trip here uh, and, and your visits in the United States said, like, this is not the time to be talking about how Palestinians and Israelis can work together and how Jews and, and Muslims and Jews and Palestinians can work together, not now, not during this terrible reality, you know, maybe one day in the future. And our feeling, my feeling, and it's very much informed by our friendship and by the years of being in this work is that we have to do this now. We have to invest in the relationships now. Otherwise, there's no reason for us to fight for a just and fair future for ourselves and each other if we don't see the other as a fully human. And I know that partially because of the normalization work that um, standing together was put on the BDS list, on the boycott, divestment, and sanction list, and I'm sure that must have been very painful, and I read some of your response to it, and um, I wonder if you can just respond... Um, because, because it feels like that move to delegitimize your efforts and you as a Palestinian person um, in the work with you as an Israeli Jew, it feels to me like, I mean, that, the day that that came down was it like, it, it was just a day of real darkness for many of us because we thought, my God, you're the hope, you're the future, and like you're the bridge for so many people between the world as it is and the world as it must be. And I just wonder if you're willing to address that. And, and what, what do you, what's the message that you wish could be heard? Um, because this is a room full of people who want to hear your message and do what we can to advance it. So I, I don't come from a place of judgment ever, uh, you know, to, to Palestine and Dispar. As, as I said before, um, I do think that in many ways... Um, it's also a project that, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu and many political leaders across the years have created where Israel is Israelis and the settlements are Israel and Judaism is Israel and Zionism is Judaism and Israel. And it's all one thing. It's an entity. And it's like created this immunity, right? 
Um, you cannot criticize the Israeli government. It's the Israeli people. It's the Jewish people. It's anti-Semitic. You cannot, you know, you cannot boycott the settlements because you're boycotting the Israeli people, Israel, which are the Israeli people, which is anti-Semitic. It's stuff that, that have been very, very effective, very, very effective. And I think in that way, you know, that's how the Palestinian diaspora has also perceived Israel and Israeli people, and they haven't made that distinction. Um, which I think what's happening right now. Um, I think there is a very, it's, it's a difficulty to disconnect between Israel, you know, as a government, as a leadership, as a state, even as a history, you know, of a, uh, as an establishment, you know, which has been extremely oppressive. <laughs> Not only for Palestinians, by the way, for most Jewish people living in the land, which I think people should also, you know, take and recognize for a minute, you know. Israel as a state has been extremely unjust for most Jewish people <laughs> in Israel, which is, you know, uh, should also be something that's recognized. Oh, I mean that um, across the years, most uh, groups, you know, immigrant groups that came, uh, that, let's say, by generalization, I want to say, uh, non-white uh, Jewish uh, um, immigrants to Israel have endured a lot of racism, a lot of police brutality, a lot of poverty, marginalization, incarceration rates that are much higher. You could see that within uh, the Jewish community. And obviously, you know, if you really look at Israel today, you should ask yourself, is it a good place for its citizens? I don't think so, for most of us, not just Palestinians. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, I lost my train of thought. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, BDS. BDS. <laughs> With that being said, um, you know, I, I think what, that's why I extend my invitation. Uh, and that's why I say <laughs> radical empathy, I think. Um, it's going to be a long way. And, and that's why I don't say it from a way of judgment. You know, obviously it was heartbreaking for me to be conditioned. You know, I literally, like, that's my experience all my life. Like, my life is conditional. Like, it's just a state of psychosis. Like, <laughs> as a Palestinian in Israel trying to make a change. And, like, having to face that from my people... Uh, on the other side, like being conditioned of what like a good Palestinian or what a good, you know, like I'm not grieving enough or hurting enough or oppressed enough or acknowledging my oppression, like I can even normalize my own oppression. It was just like, it's, it's absolutely uh, ridiculous. Um, I, I do think that we will get to a place I really believe it, you know, we will get to a place where uh, the Israeli people um, will, will be able to um, disconnect themselves from the government in a way that we can actually create um, sorry, it's just very hard for me to talk about this um, I think Israelism, in a way, needs to redefine itself in order for Palest and, and Palestinianism as well, and the Palestinian diaspora and what it means and how they view itself. We all need to like have a shift in paradigm and how we view ourselves on our land. Uh, it's going to take a lot of time. It's going to it's going to need to shift the paradigm. You need to create a new a whole new culture, a whole new terminology, a whole new political imagination of how things can be. And it's going to take a lot of time. So um, when I react to, to BDS and to these accusations, I don't do it from defensiveness. I do it from a place of like, I understand. Now let's like talk. <laughs> uh, and I hope that's the approach people should have, you know, and understand that people also hold their own you know, heavy, 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 heavy emotions, you know, across generations. Sorry, <laughs> It's okay. Um, so, thank you for that. Um, I, I, I have a few more questions for you, and a couple people submitted questions before, and I'm grateful for that. Um, and so, I... Um, <laughs> 
I want to, I'd love to ask you, um, Rachel Goldberg, who's Hirsch, um, Poland Goldberg's mother, wrote a poem a couple of months ago um, about planting a tiny seed. And in this poem, she envisions a future. Her son Hirsch has been in captivity in Gaza for one, for, he's one of the remaining 134. Um, she said she envisioned a future in which she is sitting with her, with, um, her Palestinian dear friend and the two of them are watching their grandchildren play together. Their teeth are yellow from drinking too much tea and laughing together about the world as it now is. And it was an inc- it's an incredible poem and a reflection of her voice, which I think has become a prophetic voice in the last many months from her broken heart, offering the language to envision a different kind of reality. And I, ju- I want to ask the two of you, if you can paint a scene for us, like just a moment that you imagine in the future that you can help us hold as part of our dreamscape of what might be, I don't know, 20 years or 30 years. And I just want to ask you to give it to us as like a a vision or an image um, in as real a way as you can, like really from the depths of your being. If the world could be what you imagine that it could be like, what do you see? good question and it's a very um, it is a very movement a moving um, you know, person in Israel right now and we have a lot of those people um, that faced the most horrible thing um, that can happen to a person and they chose to be in a place of letting go of revenge of the rage of seeing them in the other, seeing the other in them. Um, And working with those families is a privilege. It is a privilege in Israel because you understand what humans can be um, in those moments. You understand the clarity of their vision. Um, And I think that, you know, coming to this scene of, of the future, I would say that in 20 years, we'll still have a lot of problems. Many, many, many problems in this very, you know, troubled piece of land we share back there in the Middle East. But there will be a group of thousands and thousands and thousands of people in the city of Haifa, where Sally got elected just last week to be the city council member. Yeah. And those people will have a lot of problems in their lives. One of them can be the fact that there are polluting factories in... No, uh, hopefully. <laughs> but, or, or, or like industries that are polluting their lives. And they will live in you know, neighborhoods of Jews and Palestinians together. They will share buildings because this is what happens right now in Haifa. We get so mixed and so entangled together. And those people will fight together against these polluting industries, against those factories, not asking whether it hurts the Palestinians more or the Jews more. They will understand something profound about our reality. It is the same reality, and we need to work together to the same future. If we are able to create this seed of understanding that the future we work for is a future that will benefit both of the people, all of the people, this will already be a very big change in Israel and Palestine. Um, I actually do this in my podcast, Groundwork. Uh, I have a, like, a mini-series there with like, interviews and I ask people to always walk me in a life, in, in a day in their life after like, their dreams come true which is a very nice political, you know, exercise, imagination exercise. And a lot of people talk about going, you know, that uh, the train to Beirut is like back and you go and you have coffee there because it's like one hour from Haifa, right? (laughs) Um, And just having affordable housing and a clean place and, and prosperity. And I think a lot of the times 
Um, we also, you know, the struggle and the narratives and the uh, the um, the stories are just they, they are limited to stop the suffering, like you know, the, the person doesn't deserve your solidarity beyond s merely surviving and actually going through prosperity. You know, Palestinians don't only deserve not to die or not to be incarcerated or not to be under military control or, or check, you know, uh, point checks. We deserve to prosper. We all deserve to prosper. And I think, you know, that's really moving also from peaceful coexistence, which is what we call peace, which is very necessary right now, right? Peace is, is extremely important, but it's not enough because it means we are coexisting peacefully. And what we want is integrated. We want pluralism. We want... We want prosperity, we want to flourish, we want beautiful, affordable, comfortable lives, you know, in one of the most beautiful spots on earth, you know, and, and uh, um, I think people deserve much more than the lack of war and lack of violence. We deserve, all of us here as well, <laughs> um, you know, we deserve so much more. We deserve good education and deserve tolerance and, and love and solidarity and um, that's what I imagine, you know, that's what we will keep fighting for, you know, we won't stop once we reach peace, it's so much beyond that um, and that's what we always should, you know, imagine and envision. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to close soon, but I want to ask you, um, one of the questions that we received was what are four things that you want to ask of us before you leave here today? And I think that question, I love that. I don't know who asked that, but I love that question. Um, four things, right? Um, because we're desperate, we are desperate to find another way here in the diaspora. And we want to be part of building this just future. Um, and I think that what people are looking to you for is some direction of what would be most helpful um, and most important from your vantage point that we could do. I think, I will say, I think that in some ways the diaspora communities are, are sometimes doing more harm than good. I think that some of what we're seeing and experiencing here is entrenching us and entrenching the movements in, uh, in realities that are not rooted in radical empathy but are instead are rooted in fear and defensiveness and division. And so I, I'm curious what it is that you are calling for right now and what four things are that we could actually do to support you so that you can be successful in the days ahead. Looking at me, okay. Um, so we go two and two? Okay. Um, so first of all, thank you. Um, we feel the support, we feel the love. Um, Sally said so. It's, it's amazing on one hand, but it's also troubling on the other hand, understanding that in two weeks we're gonna come back to violence and aggressions and tough realities. Um, but, but thank you, it's important for us. And I would say that one thing um, is we need to spread this story. We need to spread the message. We need to create a camp, a new middle camp, not one that is not addressing the reality and you know, does not acknowledge the occupation, does not acknowledge the oppression of Palestinians. We are very clear about it. But a camp that can acknowledge the fact that also Jewish people and Palestinian people will benefit from the change we want to create. It's not either or, it's not us and them, it's a story about making this land survive and this is the only way to allowing it to survive. So we need to hear this messaging, these stories coming from everywhere. People in the world care right now about what happens on this land, they see the news, they're engaged, they, they go to the streets, they, they post online. So make these voices count, demand a solution that is 
good for all of us on the land, that is seeing all the lives on the land, and that is demanding the political, the political demand to end the oppression of the Palestinian people, to end the occupation, because this is on, the only way to allow Palestinians to live, but it is also the only way to allow Israelis and Jews to live on this land. So this is one thing. Share this message. Um, the second thing, and, and I, I will say it very directly, we need um, financial support. We came here to the US um, with not an easy decision to, to, to leave, also because we see the amount of power our political rivals, the political forces in Israel that are wasting no seconds, no time to advance their crazy messianic ideas. They have billboards, they have the ability to buy media, they have the ability to move a lot in the reality and to convince people. And it's also a question of how to get support to our message, how to compete, to really compete this crazy sorry to say, fascist political camp in Israel, and we need the support to be able to create our message as a stronger message, as a more convincing message, and there are ways to do that. You can find, really, ways to support us online. Um, those are two things, and please. Okay, <clears throat> two others. I actually have them. Uh, the, second, the second, third one, I guess, other than promoting the message, is also doing you actually have like much more space and I, I dare say privilege to create the bridges that we are creating back home, so you should do the same. <laughs> um, I think this divide right now in, in, in the camp here in the left is just absolutely ridiculous and it's hurting you. It's hurting you a lot. It's hurting the future of Americans in this country and it's hurting us. It's hurting and it's very, very scary and I think um, a lot of it needs to be, you know, you need to do much more work and be more open and get out of your screens, get out of, you know, Twitter and of Instagram and actually, like, talk to people, talk to your community, do the hard job. And the fourth thing is your own politics actually impacts us. I think... Um, you know, there is this understanding, you know, in, in Israel, you know, there's this feeling that there is this un unconditional blank, unconditional support and, and blank check from the U.S. It's, you know, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna let these lunatics block aid to starving population of hundreds of thousands of people. So we're gonna build a multi-million dollar, you know, from American tax dollars port so we don't have to deal with these lunatics. We're just going to go and build a port. And I think, you know, I'm just giving you a very extreme example of the absurdity of you know, this relationship, of this dynamic. With that, on the other hand, I think Joe Biden, when he does talk about a Palestinian stake, when he does talk about peace, it actually becomes something that is not overtone. It becomes within the spectrum of the Israeli public and what they can hear. And then it actually gives us much more relig legitimacy and relevancy to our people. So, you know, when you organize, after you make those bridges and do the work, you know, actually understand, you know, we, we will stay in touch and understand what kind of messaging here is heavily gonna impact our work as well and gonna allow us to talk to as many Israeli people as possible, and I think that's that's extremely important. Well, beautiful. Okay, so I'm, I want to I want to give a quick follow up to eat, to a number of those things. One, in terms of doing the work here, I know that there is a standing together friends of standing together that has emerged. Um, some of you are here in this room. Thank you, and God bless you. And I, I really hope that people here in, in our community understand what a resource this is and how imperative it is that we also join this conversation and this work. I also mentioned Aziza and, um, and Andrea and the work of Newground, and this is another way that we can continue to find our way to each other. Um, what Alonli said about, um, about resourcing, I'm going to take the rabbinic privilege here to just say a word about this. It is not an accident that the forces that control the discourse in Israel are the, are the, are, 
are the most dominant voices in the conversation. They are extremely well-funded. Their voices are amplified, their voices are platformed, even by people who ostensibly do not agree with the extremism of their views. It is on us, it is incumbent on us who believe that there is a different way forward, not just to like your posts on social media, but to platform you, to amplify your voices, and to resource you, and make sure that you have the money that you need in order to put up the billboards that are gonna express a different view than the view that currently prevails in the street there. And so I really am asking our community, and I know that there are many communities who are here today, if this voice matters to you, if you believe like I do that the only future is a just future for Israelis and Palestinians, a shared future in which all people can actually live in peace and with dignity, with individual and with collective rights, then we actually have to support that future, not passively. We have to do so actively, and I'm so grateful to know that our support will go to you. We can support standing together through the new Israel Fund, we can support them directly, but it is imperative that we actually offer the support that you need in order so that you can continue to thrive. The and the last thing, the last thing I want to say um, before I'm gonna close with a blessing is what you said about our political reality here in the United States is really crucial. I think we can all see with great dread a presidential election that is looming where a coalition of people who share values around what it means to build a just future here in the United States and in the world is completely, has completely ruptured. And it is absolutely essential that, and I'm not, I'm obviously, I, just to be clear, I think everybody knows what matters most to me, which is building a just and loving society. It is absolutely essential that we find our way to each other, that we break through this divide right now that is literally tearing us apart on our college campuses, on our streets, in our communities, in our families. One of the ways that we can do that, actually, is just by talking to each other today. So please don't get up quickly and leave. I know you've been here, some of you, for like six hours. Just take a minute because there are people in this room who have never been in the same room together before. Introduce yourselves to each other. Say hello, greet one another, ask each other, Malach, how's your heart? What do you see from your vantage point? And then bless each other. And maybe this is the beginning of planting a seed for a different kind of discourse that we in this LA community might have with one another. I close now by, I just want to offer you a blessing, and I forgive me because, um, because I'm a rabbi and a mother, and I, I am so deeply grateful to the two of you for the sacrifices that you have made in your lives in order to stand on the public platform in very unpopular ways at home and abroad again and again and again for years. I am so grateful for the time, for the love, for the effort, and for the sacrifice that you've made. And I really bless you with continued health and safety, physical, spiritual, and emotional safety and strength so that your voices can continue to ring out with such moral clarity and such precision as they have for years and must continue in the years ahead. And I bless you that you are tender, with your own hearts in the days ahead because this is extremely difficult. Give yourselves a day off. Give yourselves a little bit of luxury and, give, and allow yourselves also to just experience joy in the midst of this battle because you need to be nourished and nurtured for this marathon that you've set out on. And I believe, I believe that this is the victory, that the victory is that your visions will actually be the future. But I wanna make sure that you are sustained for the long haul as you engage on this very, very holy work. So thank you to both of you so much and thank you to this beautiful community. I'm so grateful to all of you for joining us today. We bless you and we thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.